If you like math, you may have heard of quaternions. You might even know that they're often used as a way of representing rotation in 3D graphics, like video games. But why quaternions instead of something simpler, like Euler angles? And how quaternions? How does something like that produce rotation? Quaternions? You know, I once met someone who knew someone that said they're super confusing and to stay away from them. They can be confusing if you're unfamiliar with them, but that's true of everything. Hmm, alright. But before you start talking like a nerd, can you explain what quaternions even are? Sure. Quaternions are a four-dimensional extension of the complex numbers. Complex numbers are of the form a plus bi. Quaternions are of the form a plus bi plus cj plus dk, where a, b, c, d are real numbers and i, j, and k are the fundamental quaternion units. So complex numbers can be thought of quaternions which have c and d equal to zero, just like real numbers can be thought of complex numbers with b equal to zero. Remember how multiplying two unit complex numbers results in a pure rotation? In other words, multiplying two complex numbers with magnitude 1 results in a new complex number with magnitude 1. Ah, I see. So multiplying two unit quaternions results in another unit quaternion. Then it's a rotation. That's easy. Well, you're partly right. It does result in another unit quaternion. But we are interested in making a 3D rotation. Quaternions are four-dimensional, so it's not as simple as that. Let's take a look at the multiplication rules of quaternions. These rules don't make it immediately obvious what happens rotation-wise when two quaternions are multiplied. Note, though, that any two fundamental quaternion units being multiplied together do not commute. One is the negation of the other. But any fundamental quaternion unit multiplying itself or a real number does commute. Keep this in the back of your mind. It will be important later. Consider this diagram. Look familiar? It's the same stereographic projection that 3 blue one brown used in his video on quaternions. If you haven't seen it, I highly recommend watching it and playing with quaternions on his and Ben Eater's interactive website, as it will help you understand how to interpret this projection. I'll place a link to those in the description. Now, imagine left multiplying 1, minus 1, and each of the fundamental quaternion units by i. It rotates the circle passing through 1 and i, as well as rotating the perpendicular circle that passes through j and k, such that 1 gets mapped to i, and j gets mapped to k. Let's watch that again, this time only focusing on what happens to 1 and j. First, left multiply both by i. i times 1 is just equal to i and i times j, according to the definition of quaternion multiplication, equals k. Wait a minute! How do you know these multiplication rules are true? You basically pulled them out of a hat. It's because this is the definition of quaternion multiplication. It's not that we know it's true, it's that we're defining it to be true. Then we can see what logical consequences follow from this definition. William Hamilton, the guy who invented quaternions, chose this definition because it has some nice algebraic properties. Now, let's see what happens when we left multiply by minus i. That's not too surprising, it just rotates the same two circles in the opposite direction than positive i did. Again, focusing on 1 and j, we see that 1 gets mapped to minus i, and j gets mapped to minus k. But now, let's try something a little crazy. What if we right multiply by minus i? Well, remember, right multiplying only rotates the opposite direction than left multiplying when you're multiplying two different fundamental quaternion units. So the circle that passes through 1 and i will be unaffected by switching to right multiplication, but the circle passing through j and k will now rotate the opposite direction. So now, 1 gets mapped to minus i, still, and j gets mapped to positive k. But wait, what will happen if we first write multiply by minus i, 
then left multiply the result of that by i, so that our equation looks like i times v times minus i, where v is some unit quaternion from the diagram. Gosh, I don't know. Wait, I think I get it. The two circles spinning in different directions will cancel out. Yes, the rotation of the circle passing through 1 and i cancelled out, while the rotation of the circle passing through j and k has doubled. We have effectively created a rotation only about the i-axis. Hooray! I did it! Do I get a prize? You earned it. We can generalize this to create a pure rotation about any unit vector that is a combination of i, j, and k. First, some terminology. The vector part of a quaternion is the component that lies in the i, j, k space, whereas the real part is the component lying on the real axis. A quaternion whose real part is zero is called a pure quaternion. The conjugate of a quaternion q is denoted q bar, and it's simply q with the vector part negated. So to describe the general form of what we just did a moment ago, we can write q v q conjugate, where v is a pure quaternion whose vector part is the 3D vector that we want to rotate. And q somehow describes the angle and axis to rotate about. And v does not need to be a unit quaternion, only a pure quaternion, so don't mix those two up. In the example we just did, v equals j and q equals i. Performing the multiplication, we saw that v rotates 180 degrees about the i-axis. So the obvious question now is, how do we pick q to perform our desired rotation about any axis and any angle? I think it will be helpful to find a way to visualize the 4D unit hypersphere, since that's where the unit quaternions live. Any suggestions? I think you're one dimension too low. Let's try this. It looks like a normal sphere, except the red region in the middle is actually a 3D space, the IJK space, which is squished down into a flat circle. The axis perpendicular to that is the real axis. Just don't forget the red region is actually 3D, and the flat appearance is just an artifact of the schematic. So this is a unit quaternion with a vector part and a real part. Let's think back to complex numbers for a moment. To specify a complex number z on the unit circle that makes some angle theta with the horizontal, you can write z equals cosine theta plus i sine theta. Increasing theta will rotate a point around the circle passing through 1 and i. But instead of multiplying sine theta by i, we can multiply it by any unit vector, so long as it's orthogonal to the real axis, and we would still get a unit circle. So, let's do exactly that. q equals cosine theta plus sine theta times the vector x times i plus y times j plus z times k. We are multiplying sine theta by the vector part of a quaternion, and in fact, the whole equation describes a single quaternion whose real part is cosine theta, and vector part is sine theta xi plus yj plus zk. Now, instead of making a circle that passes through 1 and i, like complex numbers, we have made a circle that passes through 1 in any arbitrary point on the 3D unit sphere. 3D, since there are only three components in the vector part of the quaternion that is multiplying sine theta. And since this point in the ijk space is orthogonal to the real axis, we're still forming a unit circle, assuming that x squared plus y squared plus z squared equals 1. Also, this guarantees that the whole quaternion will still have length 1, since cosine squared theta plus sine squared theta equals 1 is always true. Now, think back to quaternion multiplication. Multiplying by quaternion q will rotate two circles the one passing through 1, and the vector xi plus yj plus zk, and the perpendicular circle to that. Multiplying by q conjugate will rotate both circles in the opposite direction. But like before, if we right multiply by q conjugate instead of left multiplying, we will only negate the rotation direction of the one circle passing through 1 in the vector part. So if we multiply q v q conjugate, both opposite rotations passing through one in the vector part will cancel out, while the other rotation will be doubled. So the vector which we are rotating about is given by the vector part of q, and the vector which we want to rotate is given by v. 
Much like complex number multiplication, the angle that we want to rotate is given by theta in this expression. But there's a catch. Since we sandwich v between q and q conjugate and end up doubling the rotation about the vector part of q, we actually end up rotating v by 2 theta degrees. A side effect of this doubling of the angles is that there are two ways to specify any orientation in 3D space using quaternions. If q rotates v to a particular orientation, then minus q will also rotate v to that orientation. This property is especially useful for animations when you want to interpolate between two orientations. It allows the programmer to choose whether to take the long path or short path to the new orientation. The fact that quaternions behave so nicely when interpolating is a major reason that they're often preferred over Euler angles in 3D graphics, which are prone to gimbal lock when two axes align during interpolation. Hey, are you listening? Inspired by Quaternion multiplication, I present the super double four dimensional flip of the century. Try negating the quaternion. A front flip might be easier. 